So after years of years of anticipation and speculation and rumors, Canon has finally announced its long-awaited flagship camera, the EOS R1, but also it has announced the successor to one of the most popular lineup of cameras they've had on their mirrorless line, the EOS R5, with the EOS R5 Mark II. Now, I've made my videos about multiple feelings, speculations, and, you know, am I still interested in Canon? And I've made a bunch of videos, but today I want to just sort of go over what was announced, what we now know. Is this worth the upgrade? What are some alternatives that you could look at? And is this a good set of cameras for video? And if it is, who it is for? All that and more today. Tune in today. Buckle up, people. This is going to be a good one. What's good, everybody? My name is James Jackson. If you're new here, I do tips, tricks, news, and reviews for the film and video making industry. So if this is content that you like, definitely make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit that bell so you can stay up to date on all the content going forth. So there's a lot happening today, not just with Canon. Also, I just saw some updates regarding Blackmagic, which will be another video today. But Canon is the talk of the day and deservingly so with the announcement of two highly anticipated cameras that we've been waiting so long for from them. And that is the Canon EOS R1 and the EOS R5 Mark II. I'm going to sort of go into the highlights that I am intrigued by first, and then I'm going to go in some of my concerns, and then I'm going to sort of talk about who is it for. And we're gonna start off with the flagship camera, the EOS R1. And to my chagrin and surprise, it is a lot more of an interesting thing that I was, in, than I was anticipating. Uh, this camera is not only sort of where I expected their flagship camera line to be, which is around $6,300. This camera is packed with a lot of features for photography, but there's some surprisingly interesting video features on the R1 that I was not anticipating, even though this is their flagship camera. Number one, we are getting Canon Log 2 with this new sensor. It is only a 24 megapixel sensor. We'll, we'll get to that in a bit. But you're getting Canon Log 2. We're getting false color in the Canon EOS R1. And for those that care about rolling shutter, it's really, really impressive. The readout speed on this camera with this backside illuminated sensor is kind of mind blowing. There's a, I saw a clip from Pro AV TV and shout out to you guys as well as CVP and everybody else that gets a chance to get the hands on the camera. I don't get a chance to get on the camera, but it's all good, Canon, it's all good. But this clip from uh, Pro AV TV was awesome. It, and when I saw the roll of shutter, it, I was, I'm not gonna lie, I was kind of blown away. It's almost non-existent. There, you can still see it a little bit, but it's practically not there. Then when you factor in the other things, like you get 6K raw up to 60 frames a second, which is not new to Canon by any means. We saw this in the R3. We saw this in the 1DX Mark III as well. So this is something that's been part of the, a part of the thing with Canon, but we get to see the newer raw codecs. And also we get new codecs. Uh, with it, with XF AVCS, which is sort of their intraframe, compressed intraframe codec, but there's also a new XF HEVCS, which is their new codec that they came with with the Canon C400. So this makes it very, very fun and interesting that the fact that there is a plethora of codecs that you get to choose from regardless of the picture profile that you choose, whether if you're in a log, HDR profile or you're in a standard Rec. 709 picture profile, you do get to choose the codex no matter what. So that is a major, major win. The other thing that uh, I think is intriguing, not necessarily for me, but I know photographers and definitely some video shooters who prefer going through an electronic viewfinder is going to appreciate this. The EVF 
on this camera is huge. It is really, really big. E like you could just stand back from a distance and you can see how big the size of this EVF is. So if you're some, now again, I'm someone that works a little bit more off the LCD screen or I'll work off an external monitor. That's just me. I'm not really a big fan of EVFs, uh, just in general. Me, me in general, but I know a lot of people do. So especially if you're gonna be going in and you just love working with EVFs, I mean, it is really, really hard to look at the one, uh, the EOS R1 and not be excited by that. Now, some other interesting features regarding this is the fact that you get 4K up to 120 frames a second along with that 6K60. You don't get to shoot in RAW, I don't believe, in 4K 120 in terms, but I do believe you get to do 4K up to 60 frames a second in a new RAW codec called SRAW. And essentially, it is a line skipping RAW. So you are gonna see a drop in terms of detail and sharpness compared to oversampled 4K, which you do have, but it's not in RAW. You will have to use the 4K fine. And I believe that one you can do up to uh, 60 frames a second. The 4K 120 frames a second, regardless of what you choose, is going to be, I guess, line skipping or some sort of pixel bending. Uh, it is not oversampled from the higher resolution. I know some people that's gonna say that's disappointing. Me personally, I use it on the R5 and it looked great. It looked great on the original R5. I believe it will look just as good as an R5, but again, I don't have the camera in my hands. Will I? Hmm tune in to find out. But until then, if you guys don't mind, just in the middle of this video, please just make sure to hit that like button once again uh, so you can help the algorithms out so people know you are enjoying the content here. Now, the biggest drawback that I think most people are gonna be talking about with this camera is the fact that it's only 24 megapixel um, sensor. Even though it is backside illuminated, even though it does have a much higher ISO range than the EOS R5 II, which we will get to in a second. Um, I think a lot of people, given the fact that it's competing with cameras like the A93, the A1, the Nikon Z9, which have much higher megapixel sensors. I, I totally get it, but if y'all go back to when I was talking about the R1, what is the thing that I've constantly said about the R1? It's all about speed, it's all about rigidity, and it's about durability. It's That is the main thing, this camera, Canon knows, give credit to Canon, they know who their target audience is with this camera. It's sports shooters, it's journalism, it's wildlife photography, it is, this is a camera you, you're supposed to go into any environment possible and it can handle whatever you throw at. That is the nature of the one series cameras, even back to the DSLR age, this has always been the case for the one series. So it shouldn't be surprised that's the continued audience that they are going to continue to talk about. All right, let's get down to the R5, which surprisingly is, has a lot of surprises, both good and bad in my personal take. Uh, let's start with the good. Uh, it shares a lot of the same features, including this new um, Digic accelerator processor well, along with being a stacked sensor. So the rolling shutter is supposed to be improved, but again, based on the video that uh, Pro AV TV released, um, say that three times fast. Uh, based on the, the video clips they released, it's not nearly as good as the R, uh, R1, which not surprising, but it looks also like it's not as good as the R3. And the Z8 is supposed, I heard from another person that the Z8 is faster. Judging by just what I have seen, um, I do think cameras like the A7S III and the FX3 are gonna have faster readouts than the R5 II, just based on the images that I was able to see. It's still though, from what I could tell, a definite improvement in terms of readout speed compared to the original R5. So if you are someone on the R5 and you're looking for a readout speed, this is definitely the improvement on that. Like the R1, it is getting C-Log2. You are also getting false colors, but in addition to false colors, you are also getting waveforms on the R5 Mark II. So you're getting tons and tons of video exposure tools. Sony, we are looking at you right now. 
What's up? You have to to supposedly professional video cameras that you don't even have, not even false color, but you don't even have waveforms on them. So what's up, Sony? When are you gonna put that in there? We're still waiting. Now the EVF is not nearly as good as the R1, but that's totally fine. For the people that this is aimed at, and I think Canon understands this, the people that are grabbing for this camera are going to be watching the LCD screen, which is still a pretty decent LCD screen. And given the fact that you have your exposure tools uh, for video, it's going to be su uh, more sufficient that way. And then like the R1, you're getting a plethora of codecs with the, all the new codecs as well. But of course, without instead of doing 6K 60 frames a second, you now can do 8K 60 frames a second. And unlike the R5C, you don't need any external power unit in order to basically use AK60 as well as all the other features like stabilization and autofocus. So that is a big plus. You know what's also a big plus that I forgot to mention that's on both cameras? Can we all say it together? Thank you. We finally, finally, finally in a Canon camera have a full size HDMI. Yes. Yes, Tannen. Finally. Thank you. Welcome to the 21st century. We've been waiting for you. Uh, some other quick things that I also want to point out is that there doesn't seem to be a limitation of recording options on this, which is a huge deal to me uh, compared to the original R5. Uh, but it does look like 4K. There is a two hour limit. Uh, as I mentioned while I was on Ordinary Filmmakers uh, live stream, this is not necessarily to me as big of a problem unless you're maybe doing some event shooting where you need to record just continuously for like four hours, then yet yeah, this could be potentially an issue. But given the fact that you these files are going to still be much larger than some of some of its competitors, especially if you're going to try to run 8K, you're you're first of all you're not even going to uh, your media cards will not even let you get to two hours. Uh, in 4K, there it's unless you ha are shooting like on eight terabytes of cards, uh, I don't see a, a, a potential where you're going to run into a problem where two hours is not enough. Vlogging uh, to me is what comes to vlogs. I only need at most an hour tops, but even then I really am more like around the 20, 30 minute time for a lot of my vlogs for a continuous shooting. So this is not, so to me, I think this is a fair trade-off and fair compromise and that's just me. But I would love to know what you guys think. Is a two hour limit a problem for you? I would love to know uh, down in the description below if that is a big deal to you. And just like the R1, you are getting 4K up to 120 frames a second. And just like the R1, you are getting 2K up to 240 frames a second, which correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is the first time ever in a Canon camera that we've had a camera that can shoot at least in 2K up to 240 frames a second. I could be very wrong, but I believe this is the first. If you guys know, definitely leave your comments down below, but I, I, I do believe this is the first time that we have it, which is going to get into some of the de definitely worthy upgrades that if you're in the Canon ecosystem that you now have a camera that can shoot at high frame rates like that. So let's go into some of the things that throw me off about the R5. Uh, let's, let's, let's just go pull the band-aid right off. It's $4,300. Uh, I was not anticipating it to be that expensive. It's not including one of the two battery, th I'm sorry, one of the three battery grips you have, which including one of them that has like a coolant uh, system, which I will definitely help with in heat anticipation, especially uh, <laughs> the heat wave that we're experiencing here in the United States uh, could definitely be a valuable investment. But I digress. $4,300 is still a huge amount of money for a camera that, if you really look at the features, it's not that much different in terms of the video. We're not, we're not talking photos, let's be clear. I'm talking exclusively video. There's, there's, there's definitely some things where, that are very similar to the EOS R5C. You could do AK60 on that. You could do 4K 120 on that. The 240 obviously is different but a lot of the features are the same. You have various forms of codec options. You have various forms of raw compression options on that one as well. 
But that camera right now, brand new, I think it's like $600 less if you buy it brand new. But if you, you can go to aftermarkets right now and you can probably find one for under two grand, which all of a sudden now you're looking at something where you can have a 13, potentially a $1,300 difference between the R5C and the R5. And while yes, the R5C doesn't have Canalog 2, it, so in theory, it's not gonna have the same uh, dynamic, it's not gonna have as good of dynamic range, but for $1,300, you can get so much things, you can get so much things that are potentially better investments over time, like lights, audio, things like uh, a, a gator carts that can transport your gear, so many different things. You can buy a whole new lens. There's so many things that you can probably invest $1,300 in. One of the things that I um, am confused about by the R5 II is, and by some, some, there were some rumors that this camera is designed to replace the R5C, and I don't necessarily agree with that, given the fact that A, there is no time code input into this camera, which I know some people may say it's not a big deal, especially if you have tentacle syncs where you, it'll send like a time code signal and you can put that in post. But for a lot of, I know a lot of sets, uh, that is going to be a potential deal breaker because time code is such a huge deal. Uh, the fact that it doesn't have a dedicated time code port on it uh, is for some people, it's gonna be a non-starter. It also doesn't look like it has shutter angle uh, in it as well. Now, this could obviously be a firmware update, especially given the fact that Sony is going to be releasing uh, a firmware for the FX3 and the FX30 where they will get shutter angle come September. So it's not as a big deal, but that is something that right now you have to think about because it it does mean you have to work a little bit more with your shutter, uh, with your shutter work. Um, but also there's potential of because if it's like the original R5, where it will have one over 50, but it will not have one over 48, that's kind of a problem for those of us in the United States that shoot 24 frames a second. To me, it's like there's a lot of photo-centric improvements that I think are great uh, with the R5 II. When it comes to the video things, don't, minus C-Log 2, which again, is great in theory, if the sensor can handle it. We don't know truly yet, uh, but we shall see. I, I'm gonna be personally, I, they, I know Canon, there's some people that said Canon is telling that this is gonna give you 16 plus stops dynamic range. That's just C-Log 2 in general. We don't know how much of that is actually gonna be usable in the sensor. Um, it could be very well an improvement over the R5C. Uh, I'm almost certain it will probably definitely be an improvement over the original R5. But in terms of the R5C, how much of an improvement compared to what you can invest in to counteract that dynamic range, like lights and modifiers, I, I don't know if it's worth it, personally. Um, and then based on, again, uh, based on the rolling shutter, it's definitely improved on the R5, from the original R5, but it's not that much better that I will say it's world's difference. It's not, and from what I saw, it's no, like, it's not resetting any uh, markets in terms of readout speed and roll shutter for video. So uh, to me, the, the R1 is a completely different story. And there's other cameras, I think the FX3, I think the A7F3, re again, I'm not really big on rolling shutter. It's not that big of a deal to me. But for those of you, if rolling shutter is a big deal, there's a bunch of other cameras that will provide you, from what I can see at least right now, better readout speed. But I'm someone who shoots on a Blackmagic Cinema camera 6K. So take that at what you will. Overall, I think with the R5 Mark II, I, at first I was like, if I'm coming from an R5, is a, a worthy upgrade? I think if you are a, a professional and you are, and you're, if you're a professional if, and you're a working professional, I think it is worth it. Um, for the simple fact, you get a full-size HDMI now. You don't have to deal with a 30-minute record limit anymore. You get C-Log 2. You get 2K up to 240 frames a second. There's better readout speeds. And then if you're on the photo size, there's definitely vast more better 
uh, photo improvements. So from an R5, I do think it is a worthy upgrade. When we start going into the R5C, that's a different story. The R5C has a lot of the video features that we already have like false colors, waveforms. It also has things like third crosshairs, which I don't think this camera has. It has dedicated time code port. Um, and the fact that this camera is going to be $4,300 and you can get a used R5C right now for probably less than $3,000. That's that much of a difference for in terms of the highlight features, AK 60 frames a second, they both do. 4K 120, they both do. Granted, the R5 II has C-Log 2. But again, the money that you could be using to get something like lights, to get uh, better audio, which is to me more a more important investment, uh, better glass. Like there's so much stuff you can do with that potential $1,300 savings that I don't know if it's worth the upgrade, if, especially if there, if it was, if they had one thing like a three, two system where there was, or they had better anamorphic options, I might be more okay with this, but I just, to me, if you're, I'll, I'll say this. If you're someone that is really big on high frame rates, look, these, these two cameras are the only options that you have in terms of 240 frames a second in the Canon lineup. So if that's sort of the area you play in, then yeah, I would definitely say go get it. Which then kind of leads me into sort of what I was saying at the beginning, which I was not anticipating. Even though it's more expensive, it's $6,300, it's $2,000 more, and it doesn't have high as high of a resolution as the R5 II, I will just be honest, for video, I I might say the R1 may be a better video camera. Yes, you're not, you don't get the higher resolution, but you're also not dealing with a massive storage. You do get dual car, uh, CF Express card slots in the R1. You don't get that in the R, R5 Mark II. You still gotta deal with an SD card slot, so you can do dual recorder and backup recording. Uh, with it being 6K and the fact that it has C-Log 2 and the fact that it's great in low light, it's a, to me, it's a perfect complementary camera to something like a uh, Canon C400. So well, yes, it's, and it's not as cheap as an R5 Mark II, but also keep in mind, I think the readout, the, the readout speed, again, when I saw that readout speed, I was actually shocked at how good that readout speed is on the R1. So to me, all those features, yes, you have other things like waveforms, but again, I think false color is a better exposure tool. I personally think there's a, there, to me, there's an argument to be made that while for the photo size, a lot of photographers may be disappointed, I think the R1 is for certain people is going to be a great video camera, just purely because of you get a lot of the similar codec options, you get, uh, you still get catalog too, you still get a lot of the video features with it. Uh, you get a better readout speed. You're, it is, get the fact that the battery grip is built in, you have the better battery life initially, and the, you're gonna probably have better, uh, higher ISO performances. And then when you look at other cameras, like I guess other categories would be something like the a9 Mark II, you got the global shutter, you got A1 with its AK, I, even though I think the R5 II is a better camera from what I can see than the A1. Um, I, and then you look at what Nikon has with their Z8 and uh, even something like their Z6. Uh, there's definitely some competitive nature to that. And then you got Black Magic where you got a camera that's gonna shoot 6K up to 60 frames a second at $3,000 and it will have time code, it will have SDI out, it will have a uh, dedicated Ethernet port, uh, potentially a second video source out, we don't know yet. Um, and you can rig it out how you want to and it will have a much bigger battery, potentially a longer battery life than the R5 Mark II. Now, I'm talking of course about the Pixis, but that camera also is probably gonna have worse rolling shutter if you're not using the gyro stabilization, then the gyro stabilization will get rid of that. Uh, won't have autofocus, so that's good for you. If you're an AF person, that's gonna be a big deal breaker. Um, it's And it's probably not gonna be nearly as good in high ISO performances. 
doesn't necessarily mean it's not bad in low light, it's just not necessarily good in high ISOs. But if you are a filmmaker that has lights, this isn't a big deal. I shoot like nighttime shots at 800 ISO all the time. So it's all about just understanding your scene and how to work with the scene. But these are my thoughts with the Canon EOS R1 and the Canon EOS R5. I would love to know what you guys think. Let me know, leave your comments down below. And as always, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And until next time, take care everyone.